Um, before we begin proceedings, um, I would like to pay, acknowledge and pay respects there goes the mic, to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Good evening and welcome to this really exciting event hosted by the University of Sydney and the Sydney Ideas Public Lecture Program. My name is Dinesh Wadiwell and I'm a lecturer here in Human Rights and Social Justice in the Department of uh, Sociology and Social Policy and I'll be chairing tonight's proceedings. It is well known that Socrates, at least as represented by Plato, was no fanboy for democracy. Indeed, he expressed deep suspicion about democracy and the freedoms it created. In a remarkable section of the Republic, Socrates exclaims, and I quote, you would never believe it unless you have seen it for yourself. How much more liberty the domestic animals have in democracy. They are in the habit of walking about the streets with a grand freedom and bump into people they meet if they don't get out of their way. Everything is full of this spirit of liberty, end quote. It is now approximately two and a half thousand years since those words have been authored. Arguably, democracy has done reasonably well since this time, and at, least in at least in terms of its acceptance as a mainstay of modern rule. However, animals have not necessarily done so well over this same period. Today, we intensively use animals on a scale that is completely unprecedented. While we have seen increased recognition and respect for animal welfare, there appear to be many pressing questions about the ethics of our use of animals, particularly in relation to the expansion of industrialised factory farming and the continued use of animals in experimentation. Why is it that animals have not been understood as subjects of social justice? Why have social justice movements largely neglected animals? And how might we include consideration of animals as subjects of justice indeed subjects of politics itself. We're extraordinarily lucky tonight to have three distinguished contributors, Professor Will Kimlicker, Ms. Glenis Uges, and Professor Duncan Iverson, each of whom I'll introduce as the evening proceeds. The structure for this evening is that Professor Kimlicker will offer his lecture first, and then we'll have a short response from Ms. Uges and Professor Iverson. After these con contributions, I'll open up discussion to the floor. And at that time, I'll ask you to come to the mic that's up the front. You'll notice that there's a video camera here tonight, and they'll be filming, the videos will be filming the three presentations from tonight. However, we will not be recording question time, so you can rest easy if you decide to ask a question. Before we get there, I'd like to acknowledge the two hats I find myself wearing tonight. Firstly, as a member of the executive of the Sydney Environment Institute, and secondly, as a member of the Human Animal Research Network, both of whom have been integral to making tonight happen. The Sydney Environment Institute, or SEI, has been in existence for a little over a year, thanks to the support of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research, Jill Truella, and Professor Duncan Iverson, who is of course here tonight. SEI comprises groups working on environmental humanities, climate change, cities, sustainable business, human-animal relations, Marry cultures and food security. Each of these groups has their own research agenda and holds its own events. On Thursday evening, for example, SEI's Food, People and Planet group, along with the Charles Perkins Centre, present the first in a semester-long series on food research at Sydney. Later in the term, we'll be coordinating events on the future of environmental movements, business practices and biodiversity, and the Agri-Foods Annual Conference. I'd also like to acknowledge the Human Animal Research Network, or HAN as we like to call it, which is one of the groups working with SEI. HAN is an interdisciplinary and cross-faculty research group comprising members from arts and social sciences, science, veterinary science, medicine and law at the University of Sydney. HAN is truly a broad church and aims to promote cross-disciplinary dialogue. HAN has supported a number of exciting events over the last few years, including, for example, an Australian Animal Studies Group conference in 2013 and a visit this year by internationally renowned geographer, Professor Sarah Watmore. 
SEI and Han are truly thrilled to have Professor Will Kimlicker here tonight to present his Sydney Ideas Lecture. Professor Kimlicker is the Canada Research Chair in Political Philosophy at Queen's University, Canada. His research interests focus on issues of democracy and diversity, and in particular on models of citizenship and social justice within multicultural communities. He's published eight books and over 200 articles which have been translated into 32 languages. Will's 1995 work, Multicultural Citizenship, is a standard issue text for political theorists and remains one of the most influential works in contemporary liberal political philosophy. More relevant though to, for tonight's presentation, Will's most recent book, co-authored co with Sue Donaldson, has been garnering critical international attention and was winner of the Canadian Philosophical Association's Book Prize for 2013. It's titled, Zoopolis, A Political Theory of Animals right, Animal Rights. And it is, I believe, an important milestone in political theory and offers a timely reinvigoration of animal rights theory and provides some extraordinarily useful tools for moving us forward towards a future where animals might indeed be subjects of social justice. I'm really pleased to introduce Professor Will Kimlicker. Thank you, Dinesh, for the very kind introduction and to uh, the Sydney Environment Institute for inviting me. It's a, it's a delight to be back in Sydney. Uh, so I want to talk tonight about uh, some tensions between the animal rights movement and other social justice movements and how we might resolve those tensions. Uh, but it might help if I begin by just uh, making a few general comments about how I see the state of the animal rights movement. Um, which, uh, to be provocative and to oversimplify, I would say has been a failure. Um, we have had an organized animal rights movement for around 30 years, uh, and there have certainly been some uh, moments of what looks like progress. There have been legislative changes uh, to you know, ban exotic animals in zoos, or uh, to increase punishment for cruelty to dogs, or. Uh, to ban gestation crates and so on. And, we, and there have been some changes in public opinion. Public seems to be more conscious of and aware of uh, issues about animal welfare. And there are well-established and well-funded uh, animal advocacy organizations. And all of that seems like progress. And some people think that we're, it's cumulative progress and we're just going from victory to victory. Uh, my own perception is, is different. As I say, it's one of essentially failure and one way to think about that is just in terms of numbers. Uh, the, the goal of the animal rights movement has to diminish the number of animals who are confined and harmed and killed for human benefit. But clearly, the numbers over the past 30 years have gone up, not down, uh, quite dramatically. Uh, and that every projection that I've seen about uh, the number of animals who will be confined, harmed, and killed for human benefit 10 years from now is it's going to be even higher. Uh, so all the, you know, the trajectory is towards more and more animals being uh, harmed and used for human benefit. Uh, and we could say that every country on the planet, uh, when it thinks about its economy, its society, uh, and its planning for the future, it, uh, all, all countries continue to assume that they will uh, rely on the exploitation of animals uh, for economic benefits, for scientific research, uh, in, in education, healthcare, and so on. Uh, no country has, has disavowed uh, that intention to, to benefit from the exploitation of animals. No country has even contemplated making such a shift. And, and the number of people uh, who, who, as a matter of principle, would disavow the right to harm animals for our benefit is essentially infinitesimally small, as measured by, by public opinions, two to three percent, perhaps, in, in most Western countries. So that, that, that's my basis for saying that it's, it's essentially been a failure. In one sense, it's not particularly surprising that uh, we all, humans, our societies, benefit in quite uh, extensive ways from exploitation of animals. In Dinesh's forthcoming book, he talks about how uh, the exploitation of animals generates a, a flow of pleasures uh, for, for us. And many of these are quite intimate pleasures uh, about what we eat, what we wear, uh, forms of recreation, and so on, that, that uh, people are obviously very reluctant to give up. And our, 
uh, enjoyment of this flow of pleasures is, is culturally sanctioned. Religion, many religions tell us that animals were put there to serve us. Uh, capitalism tells us we're permitted to commodify animal life. Uh, various uh, European intellectual philosophies have, have said uh, that only those who are capable of certain kinds of uh, rational or cognitive processes are worthy of respect. And so, so we have a whole range of, of cultural influences that uh, authorize us uh, to benefit from the exploitation of animals. So given all that weight of, of history and culture and, and, and self-interest, it's perhaps not surprising that, that the animal rights movement has been a failure that may have been overdetermined. What I think is more interesting and what I really want to talk about tonight is not why uh, the animal rights movement has failed in, in general, amongst the general public. I'm more interested in why, why the animal rights movement has failed amongst the left. Uh, so if you, if, why uh, have so few other uh, social justice organizations or movements expressed any sympathy with uh, the animal rights movement? Uh, John Sabanatu says that uh, that the left historically up until today has responded with more or less complete indifference to human violence against animals, and that seems to me an accurate statement about the left. Uh, so it, it's generally the case with social justice movements that they at least ritually express support for other social justice movements. So a, an organization that's committed to labor rights would, as part of its platform, at least ritually express support for, for gay rights, for disability rights, for gender rights, and so on. This is part of the way one manifests one's identity as belonging to the family of social justice movements, uh, but virtually no uh, labor rights movement, gender, uh, gay rights, disability rights, none of these have even expressed ritual support for the idea that we should uh, stop building our societies and economies on the exploitation of animals. So one way to think of this is that, is that the animal rights movement is essentially an orphan of the left. This is Blair French uh, uh, used this term and it seems to me accurate that the animal rights movement emerged out of the left. Virtually everyone who, was, who has been involved in the animal rights movement came out of other social justice movements um, and view their work as consistent with and continuous with uh, other social justice movements, but uh, that sense of kinship has been disavowed. So the animal rights movement is a kind of offspring of, it's progeny of the left, but the left has disavowed it. Uh, and so it's an orphan of the left. Uh, okay, so that's, that's um, what I'm most interested in, is why, why has the animal rights movement failed to gain much traction in the left generally? Uh, and I find that both an intellectual puzzle and a political problem. So let me start first with why, why I find it an intellectual puzzle. <clears throat> so it seems to me, that part of the reason I find it puzzling is that virtually all of the most important uh, intellectual developments in the left over the past 40 years, I would say should have pushed the left towards embracing the animal question. I, I, I think there's a lot of different things to, uh, that we could talk about. Let me just focus on two examples of this. So one, one it concerns the left's idea about, um, some, if you like, the kind of moral foundations of the left's concern with, with justice and with, with the well-being of, of uh, humans. So what is, the, what is the basis of, what's the left's conception of the good of human lives? So if we go back 150 years ago and go back to, to Karl Marx, he had a very specific account of what, what, was, what was it about human beings that, it, that uh, was worthy of respect and concern and that should motivate, our, motivate the left. And his account, and this is consistent with a very long tradition of Western philosophy, is that humans deserve intrinsic respect for what differentiates us from the merely animal. And on Marx's view, what, what distinguishes humans from the merely animal is our ability to master the external world through uh, creative and, and cooperative labor. So this is often described as Marx's kind of Promethean view of, of uh, human species. Uh, and so, so for Marx, nature, and nature here including animals, uh, is just kind of the stage on which humans exercise these Promethean powers to transform the external world in accordance with our uh, conscious and creative uh, plans. 
And that that's, that, it's that capacity that, that we have that animals lack, which makes our, us, our lives, worthy of intrinsic respect and, and makes us entitled to use animals who lack this capacity as the stage for, for our Promethean transformation of the external world. Okay, so that, that's an example of a, a view of the human good, which explains why we don't have obligations to animals. The problem is that, I mean, that view, I think, has been entirely discredited on the left. Not that, that, so that view that, that, that what, what's worthy of, of respect in human life is, is what distinguishes us, us from the animals and that what we, is, is, what, is our ability to transcend uh, the merely animal or the natural. And, it, and the reason it's been rejected on the left is not because it has uh, negative consequences for animals, but because that view of the human good has, in practice, ended up justifying all sorts of injustices amongst humans. So if you say that what's, what's, the, 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 what's worthy of respect for uh, humans is this ability for uh, tra you know, transformation of the external world, well, it turns out that some humans seem to be more able to do that or more willing to do that than others, and that justifies human hierarchies. And so, for example, feminists have, have argued for a long time that Marx's view privileges men who engage in productive labor transform the external world, whereas women's reproductive labor is merely animal. It's, and, and Marx, there are passages in Marx that, that imply this, that women's reproductive labor is merely animal and therefore is not really worth uh, any form of respect, whereas man's productive labor is, so it justifies a form of sexism. It's obviously ableist. It, it clearly privileges those able-bodied people who have these Promethean powers of of uh, transforming the external world and justifies discrimination against disability. It's also racist or colonialist. So Marx's view about what's worthy of, of respect justified, and, and this Marx himself says this, that Europeans who transformed nature through agriculture are clearly more human. They're engaged in a more human activity than indigenous peoples who are simply involved in subsistence hunting and gathering, for example, because the Europeans are, are engaged in this kind of Promethean transformation of the external world, whereas the indigenous peoples uh, are not, and so that justifies the Europeans colonizing and displacing indigenous peoples. Okay, so this is, I mean, I can go, there, there are other versions of this critique. It's, we've had essentially waves of feminist, disability, uh, post-colonial, multiculturalist critique of, of that view of the hum, human good. And in response to those critiques, I would say the left has now converged on an account of the human good which doesn't talk about our ability to, to transcend nature or to, uh, to, to our distance from animality, but rather emphasizes how we are, if you like, embodied subjects. That this is what, what is worthy of concern for humans is the way in which we have a subjective experience of the world. We are, we are subjects of yourselves. Um, and that, that we need to, to honor and respect and understand people's subjective experience of the world, but those subjective experiences are deeply embodied, and we are always vulnerable to, we, we are finite physical beings, let's say we're human animals, uh, and that our well-being is intimately tied up with uh, the, the, the treatment of our bodies and forms of bodily discipline or biopolitics, if you like. So that, I think this is, this, is a, this is the conception of the, of the good, of the human good, which I think underpins most strands uh, uh, of the left, that we, what we are is fundamentally embodied subjects, and uh, uh, concern for humans is concern for embodied subjectivity or embodied selfhood. Now, it seems to me if you start from that account, unlike from, if you start from Marx's account, it very naturally should have led you to concern with animals. Uh, because animals are also embodied subjects, embodied selves. They have the same characteristics of having subjective experience of the world and uh, being vulner physically vulnerable beings. And I think that if you, if you look at the actual normative theories that have emerged across the left in the last 20 or 30 years, again, the, the natural extension of them, the natural interpretation of them should have been to include animals. So if you think about feminist ethics of care, for example, you think if you read the accounts of the good that caring relations are intended to make possible, or the account of the harms and vulnerabilities that caring relations are intended to protect us against, they are all clearly at stake, not just in relations between humans, but also in our relations with animals. The, the goods and the harms and the vulnerabilities are, are at play in, in, in interspecies as well as interspecies relationships. Or if you think about uh, recent debates about global justice in the left, which rely, uh, many of which rely on capability theory. 
uh, as an account of global justice? Well, if you look at capability theory, and you, again, you look at what is the good that capability theory is intended to protect in human lives, what are the harms and vulnerabilities that capability is intended to protect us against? There too, they naturally, they, they, they are clearly at stake in our relationships with animals as much as in our relationships with other humans. And it seems to me just quite, it's just theoretically arbitrary and unjustified for the left to have excluded animals from their account of, uh, of, uh, of justice. Given this new, given that we've shifted from the old Marxist view of a Promethean mastery of the external world to this, uh, these, this new idea, and I think there has been a convergence on the left on this idea of respect for embodied subjectivity that I think uh, naturally should have extended to animals, but for whatever reason has not on the left. A, a second example of this would be our theory of historical or social change. So again, go back to Marx. Marx had essentially a kind of monocausal theory of historical change, which is that there's one cleavage which is fundamental, namely class, and that other cleavages like race or gender, other forms of hierarchy, uh, or other axes of domination are on his view secondary in the sense that they only emerged because they were functional for the reproduction of class, which was the fundamental cleavage, and that therefore we have no need really to fight racism or sexism, because those are just byproducts of the fundamental driver of, of history, which is class, and that if we get rid of class hierarchy, gender and, and, and racial hierarchies will disappear of themselves because they only arose because they were functional for the reproduction of class inequality. Okay, so that, that view has been criticized, although some people just want to criticize it by replacing it with some other monocausal theory. And so some, there, was a, there was a moment in feminist theory which said, no, it's, it's patriarchy that's the fundamental cleavage, and class only arose because it was functional to the reproduction of patriarchy. But I think, I think virtually everyone on the left today thinks that that whole way of thinking is just misguided. There is no single motor of, of history. There are multiple cleavages, multiple dimensions of inequality uh, and domination, and none of them are reducible to, to others. They're all distinct but they're all intimately related and they all feed off of each other. So this is the core insight of intersectionality, which I think is, is the dominant approach on the left these days. And so for example, if you want to understand the nature of class hierarchy in our society, we need to understand the way in which class hierarchies are connected to, related to, racialized, that there's a racialization of class and there's also, uh, the, so, so race feeds into our understanding of class and vice versa. And that's what intersectionality is, is about, so trying to understand the way in which those, these different hierarchies energize each other, how they feed each other in ways that uh, uh, reproduce injustice. Okay, so that's the dominant view on the left today about our theory of social change is that we need to understand as a system of interlocking oppressions. Okay, now again, that just seems to me naturally to lead us to think about animals because species hierarchy is another dimension of domination, which is intimately linked up in exactly the same way with uh, other forms of, of hierarchy. So just as class and race feed off of each other, race and species feed off each other. So we want to understand processes of racialization. We need to understand the way in which tropes about animality play into our understanding of racialization and vice versa. These hierarchies, so Claire Jean Kim talks about the way in which uh, racial hierarchies and species hierarchies uh, energize each other in, in exactly the way that in, uh, intersectional analysis would predict, and yet 99% of the stuff that's done under the heading of intersectional analysis on the left today completely ignores the question of species. Okay, so I, I, find, I, I just find it kind of intellectually puzzling that people who are so committed to this account of the good as, as embodied subjectivity and to a theory of intersecting oppressions nonetheless are, manage to, to avoid uh, the animal question. So as I say, it's philosophically puzzling, but that's not, that's not really my main concern. I, I'm more concerned about the political consequences of this uh, situation, which the, the fact that the animal rights movement has been not able, has not been embraced by the left, as I think is part of the explanation for why it's failed generally. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate that. I, I don't want to imply that if the left had embraced animal rights 
that we would have achieved you know, utopia on the animal question. Uh, the, the left has lost power in a neoliberal age, and so maybe even if the left had embraced animal rights, we still would, would, would be losing uh, many of the battles. But nonetheless, I do think uh, that, the, that there, there's been a political price for the fact that the left has been so indifferent to violence against animals. Uh, and, and more generally, th looking into the future, I think there's no way for, for the animal rights movement to possibly succeed without the support of other social justice movements. And so I think there's a political project, uh, um, the, the political project that I'm interested in is how we might bring animal rights back into the family. So it's no longer orphaned, but rather bring it back, readopted back into the family of, of the left. Um, so we need to figure out what, what, is, what is the explanation for, what, for the left's indifference to the domination of animals. Uh, so one explanation is just is an obvious and, and, if you like, cynical one, which is that people on the left, like everyone else, uh, benefits from this flow of pleasures that we derive from the exploitation of animals, they enjoy these intimate pleasures as much as anyone else. It may, it may be philosophically inconsistent for the left to enjoy this flow of pleasures, but faced with the choice of being inconsistent and keeping those pleasures, or being consistent and renouncing those pleasures, most people on the left, it seems, would rather be inconsistent but keep the pleasures. Uh, I, I, that's, I, I, I think that's actually, that's, that is the fundamental explanation, I think. We, we probably don't need to make it more complicated than that. I think that's, that's essentially the explanation at the end of the day. But, but uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that it's not just that. It's not just that people on the left uh, enjoy the flow of pleasures from the exploitation of animals. That there is also possibly at least a, a sincere, good faith concern that endorsing the animal rights agenda would have negative consequences for other moral commitments of the left. So it's not just because it, people might have to renounce certain pleasures, but because they worry that it would actually have negative consequences for other social justice commitments. So why, why would embracing animal rights possibly have negative consequences for other social justice movements? That, that I think we really need to think through that question and figure out are there any good arguments for that view. And so let me just, let me discuss two arguments that I hear and which I think we need to, we need to carefully evaluate. So one is an argument about dehumanization. So, the, so um, one of the very common mechanisms for the reproduction of inequality involves the dehumanization of disadvantaged or subaltern groups. So dehumanization here is a term used in social psychology. It doesn't literally mean denying that someone belongs to a human species. It's rather denying that they have what are seen as essentially human qualities, namely the qualities that distinguish us from the mere animals. So these qualities are things like intelligence, moral virtue, uh, self-restraint. So you know, animals are seen as stupid. They're seen as, as impulsive. Uh, they're seen as cruel, whereas humans are seen as intelligent and virtuous and, uh, and uh, engaged in self-restraint. Okay, and so we know, this is very well established, that part of what is involved in processes of racialization and other forms of, of subordination is to dehumanize people. It, and you, can, you can show this on public opinion polls that people tend to view disadvantaged groups as lacking these distinctly human qualities. Uh, and as more having the, the an, animal qualities of being stupid and impulsive and, and so on. Uh, and that that's important. It's not just that it's a, it's, a, it's a, a, a nasty form of prejudice, but it's also, we know, that when people uh, uh, have these dehumanized, dehumanized attitudes about outgroups, it affects their behavior towards these outgroups. That is, it justifies, if you, if you think that these outgroups lack these distinctly human qualities, it justifies treating them roughly. I mean, to put it simply, it justifies treating them coercively, uh, paternalistically, because they're, they're impulsively up. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and so, so there's, a very, there's a very tight psychological link between processes of dehumanization and negative, negative treatment. Okay, so this is, this is a fundamental problem for the left. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's one of the fundamental tasks of the left is to fight against these processes of dehumanization, right? Okay, and I completely agree with that. So now the question is, how? How do you fight against processes of dehumanization? And it seems to me that the left has relied on a particular view. It's made a prediction about what, what uh, helps to fight dehumanization and what tends to, to exacerbate dehumanization. And the prediction is that we best fight dehumanization by, uh, by drawing uh, a sharp break between the human and the animal and to, emp and to basically to sanctify the human. That is to say that the, the, the best way to fighting dehumanization is to emphasize that the human is qualitatively different from and superior to the animal. So the human is like sacred, this is the sanctification of humanity. And that it's therefore outrageous for anyone, for any human, who should be treated in this sacred way, as if they're an animal. And so, th so that's, the, and so this is, so the idea is that if we emphasize a, a sharp radical discontinuity between the human and the animal, that helps, to, that helps, that's a rhetorical tool or strategy for showing what's wrong with treating outgroups as, as if they're animals. Or it's what's wrong with dehumanizing them. And so the idea is that outgroups can benefit strategically. It's an asset for them to be able to share in, to partake in this kind of supremacist ideology that humans are radically discontinuous and superior to animals. So that, so that the sanctification of species is a political asset that disadvantaged groups can use to fight dehumanization. That's the prediction that the left has made. And Claire Jean Kim has tracked this. This, this, this. this was clearly a decision that, for example, the African American Civil Rights Movement made, is to sanctify species boundaries as a strategy for fighting dehumanization. Okay, I, that seems to me an entirely plausible, entirely understandable strategy, but it's an empirical question. What is the effect of the sanctification of, human, of species boundaries on processes of, of dehumanization. And it turns out it's the wrong strategy. Uh, this is actually a well-studied field of social psychology and studies have repeatedly confirmed that those people who uh, draw the sharpest species boundary between humans and animals are much more likely to dehumanize human outgroups than those, like animal rights believers, who have a much uh, flatter hierarchy between humans and animals. Those who view humans and animals as much more continuous are much less likely to engage in the dehumanization of outgroups. Multiple studies have shown this. And in fact, it's not just a statistical correlation. You can actually see this experimentally. So what they've done is, you know, they've got the two large, they create random groups of people. Uh, they divide people up randomly into two big groups. One group gets a news report that, uh, that emphasizes how humans are radically discontinuous and superior to animals because of our reason or this or whatever. Uh, the other group gets a news report that emphasizes the continuities between humans and animals, the, the fact that we're all embodied subjects and so on. So, so they read these two different reports and then they're asked a series of questions about their attitudes towards immigrants, towards, you know, uh, towards indigenous peoples, towards single mothers, whatever. Those people who got the news report about the radical discontinuity between humans and animals are much more likely to dehumanize human outgroups than those who got the news report about continuities between humans and animals. So I just think it's empirically, that, so again, it's, it, it's a very important political challenge for the left to fight dehumanization, but we need to know what actually works in fighting dehumanization. And the evidence suggests that trying to draw a sharp species boundary between humans and animals worsens the problem of dehumanization and that uh, uh, defending an animal rights view helps to, to counter dehumanization. Okay, so that's one uh, <clears throat> argument that, that I hear on the left 
about why, why ad adopting an animal rights position might weaken other social justice movements, namely that, that it might exacerbate dehumanization, and I just think there's no evidence for it. A second concern is about cultural bias in the way in which animal rights ideals or principles would be applied. So people who believe in animal rights, their motivation is to care, is, is a concern for vo these vulnerable uh, animals, but, and that's uh, uh, honorable, but the worry is we live in a society that is racially stratified and multiple other forms of axes of domination, and so we can reasonably expect that if an the concern for animals is politically mobilized, if it becomes a matter of uh, of political salience, that it's going to be applied in a biased way that singles out minorities, that, 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 that tends to selectively uh, single out minorities and uses the treatment of animals as a kind of stick to beat minorities uh, and as evidence of the fact that they're backward and uncivilized. So there's a long history to this, right? If you, if you, if you, if you think about European attitudes during the era of, of colonialism, the, the, the justification for why Europeans were civilized and why people in the developing world were backward and in need of the tutelage of white Europeans was often based on, on two things. One, the treatment of women, and the other, the treatment of animals. That, this, that the, both of these were markers of their backwardness. So the, what whites, whites vaunted themselves as civilized because they were much more civilized in their treatment of women and, and animals and, and uh, uh, indigenous peoples and uh, uh, where the natives generally were, were seen as backward because of the, okay, so that, that's not just a historical phenomenon. We, we can see it t today that when issues about animal welfare become politically mobilized, become salient in the media, we can predict and we can see that it they often ends up targeting uh, minorities, that a disproportionate amount of time and energy is spent discussing how minorities treat their animals. So things like uh, halal slaughter, uh, ritual slaughter by Jews and Muslims, or things like indigenous peoples and the whale hunt in the United States, or the seal hunt in Canada, or religious sacrifice uh, by the Santeria religion. They, they sacrifice chickens as part of their religious ceremonies. Um, so, so all of these have been matters of kind of intense uh, or shark fin soup uh, by, in Chinese communities. Um, so these have been subjects of kind of intense media scrutiny and public debate, even though all of them added up together are just a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of animals that are abused in our society, most of whom, the overwhelming majority of whom, suffer at the hands of institutionalized uh, factory farms or, or scientific experimentation, which is done by dominant groups. But, but that, that is more or less left undiscussed, and instead, uh, concern for animal welfare gets gets latched on to minorities, and not just accidentally or unintentionally, but in, in some cases quite deliberately. So we see, for example, a very disturbing phenomenon in Europe these days, that right-wing anti-immigrant parties who've never, ever lifted a finger to help animals have all of a sudden become champions of animal rights as a tool to beat Muslims on the issue of ritual slaughter. So a number of anti-immigrant parties have made it part of their platform that we need to protect uh, animal welfare by banning ritual slaughter. They don't care at all about animals. They, they aren't, I mean, this is completely insincere. What they, what they want is to make life miserable for Muslims. That's what they want to do, and they're using animal welfare in a purely instrumental way to achieve that. Okay, so this is, this is uh, we, we should expect this process to take place. It's taking place, we should expect it to take place. So this is a culturally biased uh, application of animal welfare arguments. So it happens all the time and we should expect it to happen. What do we do about it? So <clears throat> the left's response, by and large, has been to say, well, so let's not, let's not politically mobile. Let's not, have, let's not make the issue of animal welfare politically salient because it runs the risk that it's going to be used in these uh, culturally biased ways that tend to exacerbate the perception. Uh, it, it tends to lead to these arguments and debates about how Muslims don't really belong here, they're not one of us, we can't trust them, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so rather than risk that, let's just not politically, let's, let's not let issues of animal welfare become politically sane. Okay, what's interesting, it seemed to me, is that 
The same issue arises with respect to women's rights, right? They, all of those dynamics are also at play in the case of women's rights, that it's, it's selectively uh, applied in ways to, uh, that often target minorities. Uh, and indeed, even, even this example about far-right anti-immigrant parties, these parties who we know from public opinion poll are overwhelmingly patriarchal in their uh, that their membership is overwhelmingly patriarchal. They've nonetheless become champions of women's rights. Why? Because they want to use it as a stick to beat Muslims on the issue about religious family law. Uh, and so, so the, the exact same dynamics of culturally biased and instrument, the instrumentalization of certain issues in order to make life miserable for, for minorities is one that, that, that we see in both the case of animal rights and women's rights. But in the case of animal rights, uh, sorry, in the case of women's rights, the left doesn't respond by saying, so let's stop talking about, it, about women's rights. Instead, the left says, no, of course we continue to be committed to women's rights, but because we're worried about this issue of cultural bias, we're going to take that into account in how we pursue women's rights. Namely, we're going to try to do it in, in consultation with, in collaboration and partnership with members of, of minority communities. We're going to try to create up uh, procedural safeguards and context to ensure that even if we will sometimes be talking about minority practices. We will also simultaneously be challenging majority practices. We will put the majority under the microscope as well as minorities, so, so minorities aren't singled out. Uh, and so this is, these are familiar tools. I mean, you're all familiar with this. This is part of the, uh, one of the important developments of feminism over the last 30, 40 years is this development of, of if, what we might call a multicultural feminism or post-colonial feminism that remains deeply committed to women's rights but recognizes the need to do it in consultation with, in collaboration and partnership with the minorities that might otherwise be stigmatized as a result of that commitment. So it seems to me all of the lessons we've learned with re in relation to women's rights could have been used in relation to animal rights. There's no reason why we could put in place the same kinds of strategies for maintaining our commitment to animal rights while avoiding the risks of the instrumentalization of it. But the left didn't in the case of animal rights because the left is indifferent to animal rights. And so it's just been willing to sacrifice that concern. It's not just, and I find that theoretically arbitrary, but it's not just arbitrary. In my view, it's actually perverse. It's counterproductive. Because if we're really concerned about the culturally biased application of animal welfare, we should stop and think about what makes it possible for these culturally biased applications to emerge. And I think the answer is that, that this kind of culturally biased and selective application of animal welfare is possible because of the status quo which is not an animal rights status quo, it's the opposite. The status quo, as you all know, is that humans have the right to use animals, but only, but, 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 so we have the right to use animals for our benefit, but we must not do so in ways that involve unnecessary suffering or cruelty. This is the fundamental conceptual framework under which animals are governed today. We have the right to use them, but we shouldn't do so with unnecessary suffering or cruelty. Okay, what does that mean? To, to say that we, we, we can use animals for our benefit so long as we don't involve unnecessary suffering or cruelty. What is the content of that? Well, the answer is that it's essentially, I mean, if you think about it, all of the harms that we impose on animals, almost all of them, are completely unnecessary. We don't need to eat meat. It's perfectly possible to be healthy and have a vegan diet. So all of the harms we impose in factory farming or any form of, uh, of the raising of, of animals for food is unnecessary. We don't need to go to zoos. All of the harms that are imposed on animals are, are unnecessary. So zoos or circuses as well. So al almost all of the harm is in, that, is in one sense unnecessary because don't, you don't need to harm animals to live. So, but the law isn't intended to stop us from harming animals to, to eat meat, the law is in, it, it, so the law is intended to stop unnecessary suffering in that sense. So in what sense is the law trying to stop unnecessary suffering, given that it's warranting the harming of animals that's unnecessary? What it means is, in practice, the law re, it, it precludes those forms of suffering that the majority in a society finds uncomfortable. Or, or put it another way, the law precludes those forms of suffering 
that, the major that do not contribute to the flow of pleasures for the majority, but rather compromise the flow of pleasures for the majority because of majority sensibility. So, for example, the majority in our society likes to eat pigs. So therefore, the suffering we impose on pigs is not unnecessary because that contributes to our flow of pleasures. So it's not cruel, it's not unnecessary, the harms we impose on pigs. But the majority does not eat dogs. Some minorities do, but the majority doesn't. So the majority views eating of dogs as unnecessary suffering and cruelty. So, that the, so the eating of pigs is, not un, is necessary suffering and it's not cruel because that's what the majority does. The eating of dogs, that's unnecessary suffering, that's cruel because that's what a minority does. This is just, this is a cultural bias. There's no, possi there's, there's no, there's no possible moral justification. There's nothing about the nature of the animals or their interests that explains this differential treatment. It's just a, it's just a difference in the cultural uh, biases of, of practices of, of one, one society or another. So, so the current legal structure encourages, it invites, I would say it actually makes inevitable this sort of cultural bias. Because we work in a legal structure, which is not based on animal rights, but rather is based on this idea of the right to benefit so long as it's not unnecessary or cruel, that in, inevitably, I think, it will always operate in a way that immunizes the majority. Whatever the majority does to animals is seen as necessary. Whatever minorities do that doesn't contribute to the majority's flow of pleasures is seen as unnecessary and cruel. It, it, the, the current legal structure not just permits, I think it actually guarantees the culturally biased application of animal welfare. By contrast, if we actually had an animal rights agenda, it, uh, it, it would mu provide much less scope for this kind of culturally biased application of animal welfare because it would define legality in terms of the rights of animals rather than in terms of majority sensibilities or majority practices. Of course, if we had an animal rights agenda, it would mean that min some minority practices, minorities would need to, to be held accountable, would need to give some account, some moral justification for their practices, such as eating dogs, but only on the same terms that the majority would have to give some justification for its eating of pigs. And I, in my, yeah, okay, so, um, so, um, so I, so, and I think that's what we want. If we want to, to challenge this culturally biased interpretation of animal welfare standards, we precisely need a legal framework which does not privilege majority practices or majority sensibilities, but rather requires both majorities and minorities to give some moral justification for their treatment of animals. Uh, and so again, the, the issue about cultural bias, I think, is a very fundamental one for the left. It's something that's of concern in all, in all of my work for many years, the culturally biased interpretation of uh, normative standards. But I think that it's not the animal rights agenda that opens the door to, to this form of cultural bias. It's the status quo uh, with its, uh, in my view, very pernicious framework of unnecessary suffering and Cruelty. Okay, so just a bit to, to conclude, I, I don't see any philosophical uh, reason why the left should not embrace animal rights, and I do not see any political or strategic reason why the left should not embrace animal rights. I, I don't think it would compromise the pursuit of any of the other uh, normative commitments of the left. <clears throat> and so I think, we, the, I think we have this fundamental task of bringing animal rights back into the family of social justice movements. How would we do that? So I, 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 so I don't ha have time. I, I, I think there's a whole bunch of things that immediately become possible if we, if we, if we took this uh, agenda seriously. There are all sorts of ways in which we can think about synergies between different social justice movements. So just to mention a couple, um, think about race and, and animal rights. There's, a, there's an, a, an American law professor who argues that in the United States, as in most Western countries, there's massive subsidies to the dairy industry, which is controlled by prosperous white people. So we're funding all sorts of money to give uh, white, prosperous white people uh, to, to, to support the production of dairy. And then there's a legal requirement that public institutions like jails, schools, hospitals buy the dairy to, to give to whom? Often racial minorities, blacks and Latinos, many of whom are lactose intolerant. Uh, so it's... So, and it's causing this public health catastrophe of both obesity and, and diabetes uh, in many of these racial minority populations. So this law professor argues that this policy of, of subsidizing dairy is a form of racial discrimination. It's 
benefiting whites at the expense of blacks and Latinos. I think there are many ways in which the, the, our food pathways in our society are racially stratified, class stratified, and that, that, that uh, pushing for a plant-based alternative would be ways of addressing a whole series of injustices around them. Uh, another example would be around gay rights. Patrice Jones is, is the founder of a, an animal sanctuary in the United States. She's a, gay, she's a gay and lesbian activist for many years. In her struggles for gay rights, one of her biggest, as, as with all, all such activists, one of her biggest targets has been ideologies of compulsory heterosexuality. Right? This is one of the fundamental targets of the gay rights movement. Okay, if you want to see compulsory heterosexuality in action, go to a factory farm or go to a zoo. These all operate on ideologies of compulsory heterosexuality. And so from her point of view, and this is something she's written about, there's absolute continuity uh, between the struggle for gay rights and the struggle for animal rights and the way in which factory farming suppresses animal sexuality. Uh, we could also talk about links between animal rights and, and disability movements and the, how ideologies of ableism are underpin uh, injustices in both cases. Okay, so I think there's a lot of such examples for possible alliances uh, uh, and grassroots connections. But let me just, if I have one minute, uh, I, I, let me just suggest, and I'm just going to throw this out because I don't have time, that, that one other thing we could do, and this has been the focus of my own work with Sue, is to change the conversation about animal rights at a more general theoretical level. And I'm just going to throw this out, it's going to be too quick, it'll be cryptic, it probably won't make any sense. But the debate we've had for 40 years on animal rights has been a debate on intrinsic moral status. And that's an important debate, and I've tried to suggest that the left's own account of what's worthy of concern in the human life extends to animals. So, we, so that, that's an important debate, but it's not the only debate we should have. What I would suggest is that we also need to think about the membership of animals. We need to shift from focusing just on intrinsic moral status to issues about membership. And particularly in the case of domesticated animals, and that's after all the fundamental issue for animal rights, is the domesticated animals that we intensively exploit, confine, exploit. Uh, and kill for our benefit. I think that we should think of animal, uh, domesticated animals not just as embodied subjects who are therefore entitled to, to concern and respect, but as members of our society. We have made them members of our society. That's just what domestication is. Domestication is a process of taking animals out of the wild, cutting them off from their former life, breeding them to be dependent on us, and incorporating them into our scheme of society and economy obviously on vastly unfair terms. So justice requires recognizing that we have made them members of our society and according them membership rights. And the tool that we use to recognize membership, in the human case, is citizenship. So the story that Sue and I tell in Zoopolis is that with respect to domesticated animals, we should think of them not just as individual beings, embodied subjects who are owed certain rights, we should think of them as members of our society, as our co-citizens. Okay, if you think, uh, that may seem like a strange, radical idea, but if you think about it, I actually think it opens up a whole new vista for creating synergies between different social justice movements. Because all of the social justice movements I've mentioned, I think are fundamentally citizenship struggles. We call them social justice movements, but they're also called citizenship struggles. And I think that's right in the sense that all of these movements are struggles for what Jim Tully calls citizenization. It's not a very happy term, but the idea is that, that relations between different human groups have historically been based on force and, and coercion and paternalism, and that we want to replace them with relations based on, on consent, on, on autonomy, on trust, on partnership, on participation. That's what citizenization means in this very broad sense. <clears throat> and I think that that also should be the way we think about our relations with domesticated animals we should try to think about ways of enabling them to be members of our society and in ways that make sense to them, uh, able to have a say over the governing of their lives. And that, and so all of the, these are all citizen, these can all be seen as struggles for citizenship or citizenization, and they all involve trying to create new spaces, new places for all of the diverse members of our society to participate, uh, to engage in trust and cooperative relationships, which would give them the ability to shape their own lives. And I think that, that, that if we think about citizenship in this way, inclusive membership in a society across species, that would radically disrupt our inherited notions of citizenship, which have not only been exclusive to animals, they have also had a very pernicious effect in excluding many humans. Our inherited ideas of citizenship have, been, have created a whole series of injustices 
for racial minorities, for people with disabilities, for children, for others, as well as for animals. And so if we, it, so this is just, this is the, the, as I say, I realize this is cryptic, it's too quick, but that uh, the, the, what I'm hoping it, it, our work will do is to offer a vision of inclusive membership in a mixed human and animal society, which would be guided by the goal of enabling all of its members to participate, to, to, to exercise some degree of say over what matters to them, and that this would involve creating an entirely new set of, of ideals and practices of citizenship that would contribute to justice for both humans and animals. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Will, for storming through the presentation. He knows, he knows I'm a tyrant. I told him I was. Um, um, but hopefully in question time, we'll get to, to, to delve further into the questions you raised. Um, we now have two short responses to Professor Kim Licker's lecture. One response from a renowned practitioner and a second response from a renowned political philosopher. Ms. Glenna Zuges is one of Australia's most experienced animal advocates and is executive director of one of Australia's most important advocacy groups, Animals Australia. Glennis has spent much of her career getting animal welfare on the agenda in Australia. She has contributed to numerous national reviews of codes of practice and animal welfare. Glennis has also worked to achieve greater protection for animals through representation on various committees, including the Victorian Animal Welfare Advisory Committee and the Advisory Committee on Animal Welfare Science on the Animal Welfare Science Centre. Animals Australia has achieved amazing success in raising the profile of animals in the Australian public sphere, including notably in the Ban Live Exports campaign, which was, and is, arguably one of the most influential animal welfare campaigns in recent Australian history. I'm really pleased to introduce Glennis to the stage. Thank you, Dinesh. And um, thank you very much to the uh, Human Animal Research Network and the Sydney Environment Institute for inviting me to come along. I love to talk to people. Um, as Will has explained, and really articulately, social justice for animals is way overdue. Um, and I find his thoughts and views and his uh, um, academic pursuit really enlightening and to sit back and have a think about these things. However, most of my, my background, of course, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is to deal with the, the here and now and how we can change it. And what I wanted to do, just of course briefly, is to talk about uh, particularly the role of animal advocacy groups uh, here in Australia, but of course it's similar around the world, and to talk about the real life challenges of bringing about change for, for animals. Animals Australia's belief is that we can and we must create a kind of world for animals, but sadly over the years, of course, I've um, come to know, and, and of course Will has talked about it to some extent, um, the real barriers that um, uh, stand in the way of achieving that kind of world. Um, I have to say to Will that I actually think that you're quite fairly right uh, in that we have to a large extent failed and it's the writings on the wall. Um, we have so many animals that are still suffering and uh, uh, I've been involved for a number of decades and it has, we have done things, but if I had to give it a, a, a mark out of 10, uh, maybe we got two, we get two. We've done some things, we've achieved something, but of course we've failed. We've failed to develop as yet, um, really bring social justice for animals. Um, I think the reasons, and I'll just go through a few, uh, the main ones that I see or have seen, is first and foremost, a lack of community knowledge, still, a lack of community knowledge and an understanding of the characteristics of animals and therefore why they need such protection. Uh, one example, <clears throat> a fairly recent one, um, related to the way we stun pigs, that is uh, using CO2, high density CO2 to stun pigs in gas chambers and that is the predominant way that most of the five million pigs in Australia are killed each year. And 
That CO2, um, recently through, through investigative um, undercover investigations, actually showed footage of the terrible suffering of pigs in that situation. Now, we didn't know that. Most people didn't know that. And so up until now, up until very recently, the community wouldn't have even thought about how pigs have, have been killed. And so just one example of lack of knowledge, and I could go through so many more, hundreds, unfortunately. A second barrier is, in fact, deliberate cover-up by industries, animal industries. And um, there are many examples of that too. I'll just relay um, some 10 or so years ago when we were trying to have egg, the egg industry put uh, labels on cartons. We wanted the, for the cage system for the words battery cage eggs to be on cartons and free range on the others and such things. Industry wouldn't have a bar of it because battery, of course, in, brings to people's mind the images of animals, uh, birds, in wire, barren wire cages. In the end, they would only agree to the words cage eggs and then we had to um, uh, do all sorts of things to make them do that, actually put it on there. So they didn't want that to be invoked. And you will know too that, and there are many examples of this, but you will know too that if you go to an, the industry websites, you will be very rarely see the worst abuses, that is the in, uh, institutionalised systems that they're kept in. They don't want photos of them on their own websites. So they're certainly covering up. <coughs> The other issue, and Will's um, described this and gone through it a lot more than I can, but uh, there are prevalent entrenched cultural norms. Um, most people in Australia have been brought up to think that we're, we're a fairly educated country, we're fairly well off, and we have animal welfare laws, we have RSPCAs in uh, many, most regions, occasionally we see prosecutions in the media, so people think many people think that we have reasonable animal welfare standards in this country. Of course, that's wrong. But again, people have been brought up, uh, grandparents, parents, um, buying the same sort of food, the same sort of um, pork chops or whatever, and not thinking about it, not, think, not knowing that they have to think about it, having no idea at all that that could be a problem, not realising that there are welfare problems and why would they? As I said, we have already know that there's a lack of information. Industry is very keen to cover it up. So we have a situation where people don't ask questions and so they don't go out to seek advice about how animals are uh, being treated. A fourth barrier, and you could realise I'm not good at speaking in very short um, bursts, um, I'd love to talk to you all night, but uh, a further and final barrier that I'll talk about is uh, the kowtowing of politicians and government to animal industries. And our system is set up that way, and certainly... Whew, and so, uh, I have to say that most of our standards have been put in place by ministers of agriculture uh, and they are listening to the rural voters, the, the farmers, and so of course we have very low standards. Um, I think uh, the, the most obvious example of that is our venerable uh, Minister of Agriculture, Federal Minister of Agriculture, Barnaby Joyce at the present time. He repeatedly plays to his audience, his rural audience, and emphasises that his core work uh, as Minister, is about doing things that produce the better profit return at the farm gate. And this is the same man who is responsible for animal welfare, so that's an inherent problem. Now, I've talked about the, some of the barriers. I want to show you, as a, a practical animal welfare organisation, how we're trying to get around those. And um, our strategies for change, if you like, and they primarily are trying to get through those barriers, uh, white anting those barriers, flying right over the top of those barriers if we can. And um, one of our most recent campaigns, you may have, may have seen some of it, the Make It Possible campaign. And that's what it's all about, trying to empower, inform people, have them empathise with the animals in situations that are, that are quite cruel, and to indicate to people how they can actually do something about it, so empower them, and so that's what it's all about, making it possible. I want to show you um, a short two-minute um, video, um, one of the ways we're trying to do something about that, and then I'll just comment on it afterwards. Thank you. Every day is the same for her. She never gets a break. She's going crazy. Being cooped up all day with nothing to do. She never gets a chance to spread her wings or live a little. There ain't no way to treat a lady. 
Most eggs in Australia are still laid by hens confined in battery cages. Choose kindly and help make cage eggs history. That's uh, part of our um, Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady um, campaign and uh, a shorter version of that's been on television through this year. Um, so we, we have tried to inform people, but of course what we've got to do is engage them, grab their attention, engage them, try to teach them a little bit about the characteristics of the animals involved, therefore evoke empathy, and then give people a way to do something about it. Um, and it's as simple as that. Um, in addition, and we've had to use paid media because there are so many barriers against getting information out there in other ways. Um, in addition, and this is what I'm optimistic about, um, that in, a, in more recent times we've been able to uh, grow our audience, if you like, um, through the web, through particularly Facebook. I think we're almost up to 400,000 people just on our, um, our, our main page at the present time. And we're able to get out to several million people every week with our material and content. And that is so, so different to even a few years ago. So, um, I do think that we'll be able to change things over time and I hope not nearly as long as uh, it's taken to get to this point um, because we do have better tools and we have a very big following and more important than that, we no point uh, preaching to people that already know, um, we are every week getting out to more and more, diff more people. What... Um, you'll notice with a campaign like this and many of our campaigns is that we are deliberately bypassing the politicians and the government because they're not going to do this for us. Community's going to do it for us. Consumers in most campaigns can help, but any event, community voices. And so that's what we have to get to. Um, so in conclusion, our strategy is clear and transparent, knowledge, empathy, leading to effective individual action. And I do have faith in informed individuals changing the paradigm, caring about animals. I think it's inherent that we do care once we know, and not just about animals, about other vulnerable groups. Um, but we do have to do a lot of work to get to that point. Thank you. Thank you so much for offering a practitioner's perspective. Professor Duncan Iverson is currently Dean of the University of Sydney's largest and oldest faculty, Arts and Social Sciences, where he also teaches in the Department of Philosophy. Prior to joining Sydney, he taught in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto, Department of Politics at the University of York, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Research School of Social Sciences at ANU. Duncan has published four books, including Post-Colonial Liberalism, which was awarded the 2004 C.B. McPherson Prize, and with Paul Patton and Will Sanders, the edited collection, Political Theory and the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Duncan is a champion of social justice within the faculty and is one of the conveners of the University of Sydney, Sydney Social Justice Network. I'm really pleased to introduce Duncan Iverson. Um, thanks, Dinesh. So I'll be really quick because I think we need to get to question time. And uh, it's great to, to be part of this event and it's great to have Will in Sydney. And Will is a sort of towering figure in the world of political theory, so it's a great uh, privilege to, to comment. I just want to say a few things and focus in particular on this idea of citizenship for animals because I think that's the most powerful, one of the most powerful ideas that Will is proposing. And I think what's powerful about it is, I was just thinking about this because I was looking at a reading list I was assigning to my uh, first year philosophy students this semester. And one of it is an is a encyclopedia entry that Brian Berry, one of the towering figures of social justice theorizing in the Anglo-American world, wrote on equality for the Garland Rutledge Encyclopedia. And Brian writes in that uh, uh, entry for equality, he says, look, uh, he's talking about basic equality, and along the way he says, look, one thing we all know is that in relation to the animal rights debate, no one on either side seriously thinks that animals should be empowered with social and political rights. Um, what he's saying is, whatever side you're on, no one actually thinks that we can think of animals in that way. Of course, he's someone who defended a very sort of strong moral relationship between human beings and animals, but the thought that animals would have social and political rights, uh, even for someone like him on the left, defending a very robust theory of social justice was just one thought too many. So that's the idea I, I want to, I'm sort of giving Will a chance to, to expand on the end of his talk. 
uh, later on in the question period. And, and, and the really interesting idea in, in Will and Sue's work in the book is this idea of challenging what they call uh, the linguistic agency that sits beneath our conceptions of citizenship. That is the assumption that human beings uh, as citizens are defined by a certain set of capacities, a certain set of threshold capacities, and that uh, this is one of the barriers to us understanding that fundamental equality extends across the species and not only within uh, the human species. The thing that Brian Berry was saying was too hard to imagine. So I just want to say, spend two minutes telling you about what this idea of linguistic agency is and why Will thinks it's problematic and why it's key to his idea of citizenship and then just pose a couple of questions for him to respond to or to get the debate going. Well, linguistic agency, as I said, is connected to that classic conception of citizenship. Think of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, think of Aristotle, uh, think of Hannah Arendt, that idea of being engaged in the public sphere, of engaging in public dialogue, of having a conception of the good, and, and even more interestingly, acting in concert, right? When we think of being citizens, we think, think of the images, the public assembly, the public debate, parliament. How do we imagine citizenship other than on those terms. That's something that Will is asking us. Why? Because if the concept of animal citizenship is to be real, we have to understand what kind of agency they have. They can't simply be, of course, they're not just our property if we take that concept seriously. They're not just objects of our moral concern. They have to be agents of some kind. That's what distinguishes, I think, for all of us, the difference between a citizen and a subject or a denizen or a subaltern. So the, the question is, though, what kind of agency do animals have? And I prepared this talk with my dog, uh, I should say my dogly companion sitting beside me looking at him, and I was searching his eyes for answers. And one of the things Will suggests in his work is, well, we have to adapt to new ways of uh, non-human animals being and acting with us. And I think, the really, I think the really powerful kernel of this idea is, is what Will got onto towards the end of his talk, which is they are part of our social and political world. And what the language of citizenship brings out is the fact that we're exercising power over them. And we have to justify to ourselves, and, and as Will is saying, to them, the exercise of that power. So if linguistic agency is the problem, what then is the solution? And, I, I, and what Will's work is suggesting is we have to sever or decouple linguistic agency from our conceptions of citizenship. But then what kind of agency are we left with? What kind of agency do animals then exercise? And how do we, how do we respond to it? And how do we engage with it? And, and, and in, in, in the book and in other work, Will and Sue try and develop this. And in, 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 in many ways, they're taking their lead from, as he mentioned, other social justice movements. Think of people who have been arguing uh, around uh, people with cognitive disabilities. How do, we, how do we engage and support the agency of people with cognitive disabilities, for example? Or how do we think about the agency of children? Maybe there are degrees of forms of linguistic, linguistic agency. The fundamental idea they have uh, is that the kind of agency we should be thinking about is the kind of agency that involves uh, someone, an agent being able to respond and contribute to shaping those norms and rules that affect you. It's a kind of norm responsiveness. So the thought is that animals, especially domesticated animals, have the capacity for norm responsiveness. And that seems to be enough for Will and Sue to think that that's the kind of agency, that's the kind of citizenship that animals can exercise. So that, I think, is a really fascinating uh, idea. Just because you can't participate in juries, just because you can't deliberate in the public forums, as, as Aristotle thought citizenship involved, for will means you, doesn't mean you can't be a citizen. But, but how, do we, how do we engage with that citizenship? How, how are we to make sense of it? I mean, I was being slightly facetious, but when I look into my dog's eyes, in what sense are they norm responsive? In what sense am I able to incorporate their preferences, their needs, the, 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 their conception of the good into my sense of my relationship with them? Am I justifying myself to them? Are they justifying myself to me? Is the entire language of just, justification itself now redundant for uh, contemporary political thinking? So one question, I guess, for me is, 
is this actually, and it sounds to me like it's not just a kind of supplement to our existing models of citizenship. I think Will was being a bit polite at the end by saying it opens up a new vista. It sounds to me like a really deep critique of our existing models of citizenship. And one question is how far does it go? I mean, Will is famous uh, in contemporary political theory for defending a theory of, of, of liberal minority rights, which says minority rights are justified insofar as they, pr as they promote or protect a liberal conception of autonomy. Well, this argument of moving away from citizenship as linguistic agency seems like a pretty deep critique of our senses of autonomy, right? The agency that Will and Sue are talking about is a kind of norm response to this. It's not about independence. It's not about sovereignty. It's about being embedded in much more complex, subtle relationships. Indeed, it takes its lead in many ways from a lot of feminist and uh, post-structuralist political theory. And it's fascinating to think or to uh, sort of get Will to think about how far this critique of citizenship really goes. And then that leads to, I guess, my concern, or not a concern, but a, a question about the nature of this agency. And as I said before, one of the powerful ideas of modern citizenship theory is this idea of our acting in common, our participating in the creation of a life world, our, 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 our recognition by others. What does that look like in a mixed human, non-human animal world? What kind of acting in concert can occur between the human and non-human animal? And in what sense can those be genuinely equal uh, <coughs> relations? It's not clear to me that um, uh, Will uh, is able to uh, articulate that, uh, uh, that vision completely yet, although obviously uh, he hasn't had a chance to, to, to lay it out in great, greater detail. And then finally, the other thing that um, uh, I think is really interesting to think about are um, the sort of limits and hierarchies that remain even with this conception of citizenship as non-linguistic uh, agency. Who's in and who's out? It's, it's always the dream of every social justice movement that they have arrived at the point where there are no more hierarchies and, and sort of no more limits to who's in and out. And in fact, when you think about this form of citizenship that Will is defending, there are still capacities that are required for um, uh, non-human uh, animals, in a sense, to be included. The kind of agency that he and Sue and other work talk about, he, as I mentioned, is this norm responsiveness. But what does that mean for different kinds of animals? And dogs and cats are in, are snakes and cockroaches out. I mean, domesticated animals are vast sort of array of different kinds in our world. So who's in and uh, who's out? And on what grounds can we make those distinctions? I think that's important because ultimately this is motiv motivated by a deep conception of equality, fundamental equality, the, the equality that Brian Berry argued could not extend uh, across species. So I'll stop there. I think the, the really powerful idea here is this idea of animal citizenship. And what it does is it brings out the fact that we exercise power over animals. And it asks us, what is the appropriate moral relationship between us and non-human animals? And, and, and the thought is that if we're going to take this idea of non-linguistic uh, agent uh, citizenship seriously, then we need to come up with different kinds or different ideas of agency. And, and, and my, my question is, just to what extent does that uh, enable us to think about animals as genuinely co-equals? when so much of our idea of political engagement is one in which we're acting together and not simply reacting to each other. So thank you.